Good morning and welcome to the Midpoint Ministry Center of the Chicago Church of Christ. My name is Wes Becton. This is my beautiful wife of 30 years, Ingrid Becton. And this is our beautiful granddaughter, Eleanor Rose Wilhelm. We are so excited to be able to welcome you this morning. We wish, thank you, Eleanor, that we could do this in person. Uh, but thank you, God, we've got the technology to be able to do it uh, this way. Good morning, everyone. Our family of seven, all of us are here together, welcomes you to the Midpoint Ministry Center church service this morning. And we are so grateful to be able to connect with you virtually and are sending a hug across the internet and across all of the technology that we are all using today in order to watch this service. Yes. yes. Eleanor is one of our unintended blessings of this horrible COVID virus and that our whole family is together under one roof, all seven of us. And we are very excited to have all of them here. So having all of us here together is, uh, is that unintended blessing. And I got to tell you, that's really what for us, a uh, family is all about. It's about togetherness. And, uh, you know, for right now, this pandemic means a lot of different things for different people. For some, it's just an inconvenience. For others, it means losses of jobs, losses of income, in some cases, losses of life. And our hearts just go out to all of those people that are on the front lines of uh, of caring for people during this pandemic, our doctors, our nur nurses, our technicians. Also, our uh, our thoughts go out to uh, thank you, Eleanor. Our thoughts go out to uh, just people that are that are hurting uh, during this time. Um, we are again just so grateful to be able to welcome you all here, and let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, God, for allowing us the opportunity to worship you. Uh, this may feel different, this may look different, but God, you are still in control. We love you so much. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you and it's in your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.
joining song Gathered round the throne There'll be no more sorrow Someday and tomorrow Heaven is our home Sing anchor for the soul excited to uh, share communion with you this morning as uh, I just wanted to talk about hope this morning and that we have a God of comfort and hope. He, um, his uh, effort was not in vain on us and dying on the cross was not in vain. And um, we just wanted to share some of the things that Danielle and I have been going through um, through this uh, experience. Um, it's been hard for me to wrap my head around this pandemic and how it has changed the world and changed us um, as a church and changed uh, me individually. It's um, hard. And um, like it or not, we've become instant teachers. We've been become instant uh, work from home. And now you have a home office. We become instant households. Uh, we thought we had family before. Wow, now we have a household and you're confined with them. <laughs> so, and, and other things that come too is that um, the struggle with um, finances and just being scared uh, and in the end feeling alone. Um, there's some of us that don't have a um, multiple people in their house. We're just alone. Um, you know, I and I'm reminded of others. They're going through struggles also. Um, people that I know that um, have dementia, um, depression, um, cancer. Uh, it's it's um, and just sin. It just affects all of us. However, we have a God of hope and comfort. In Isaiah 40, I've been studying um, hope a lot lately. And it says in Isaiah 40, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sin. Um, it's overwhelming to think of all these things um, and consider a God of comfort and hope. And I'll share about a little bit of my struggle with that. But um, I would like uh, Danielle to uh, share a little bit first. Um, I'll start off with um, a scripture in Romans um, 6, verse 5. It says, if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we are united 
with Christ and therefore um, can be united during this time and have hope um, that we aren't alone, that that God is right there with us. Mm-hmm. And this has been a um, an overwhelming week uh, filled with many emotions uh, from joy um, um, and laughter um, to intense moments of doubt and security as um, being a homeschool mom and teacher and, and uh, running the house and fixing extra meals and extra, you know, doing extra loads of laundry and just trying to keep up uh, with things at home um, to, you know, experiencing um, concern and extreme worry over family members who have mm-hmm. been suffering with terminal illness and um, decisions uh, about that illness and, um in family members who have experienced uh, violence, um, you know, gun violence, and um, children who have been um, preyed upon in my family, and uh, so it, it, it has been very up, up and down, and scary. Um, so the cross this week has definitely meant hope, and um, hope that mm-hmm. even though I can't get to my family members and and hug them and and physically be there with them as they're going through these um, challenging and and tragic times, God can, and that they are not alone. Um, um, Hope does not disappoint, it says in Romans 5, and it doesn't uh, because it's God that provides hope through the cross. Mm -hmm. That's... You know, and I think of those things also. It's it's hard to go through um, and think about others' struggles in our family and friends. And um, me personally, it, it, I think of um, my cancer that comes and goes and how I'm dealing with that and uh, providing for income for our household and it's, um, I'm scared about things. And as I get more scared, Danielle's, you know, reaches out to me more and pulls out my heart, but I'm studying it. So I, I study out hope and it does offer me great comfort. And I'm just so relieved by that. It's, um, you know, the, um, the cross was not in vain for me. It really is. And in this time of separation, I just think of, um, there's a meme out there of the Last Supper, Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper, but then they took it apart to look like Zoom. So all the apostles are in different frames of the Zoom scene. And it's, while funny at first, it's um, heart-wrenching too for me that um, I can't see you all right now and I can't wrap my arms around you. It's hard, but um, in Isaiah 40, it goes on to say, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and gathers them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. And I've seen that in our household. Um, Danielle certainly have borne fruit with that and he's changed me. And I know that um, with you also, you know, he's a God of comfort. Um, He's going to always be with us. We're not separated from him. Um, His dying on the cross was not in vain for us. Uh, One more from the end of Isaiah 40, just because I like this chapter. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Uh, Let's pray for our church, for our communion church. God, I thank you so much for being a God of hope and comfort, that your dying on the cross was not in vain, that you've taken our sin on you that you've united us with you, God. We are not separated from each other. We're not separated from you. Um, You give us great comfort. We pray that um, you continue to offer us comfort in our friends and family, 
and that you uh, bless this bread and this wine that we're about to partake. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you to the Flugers for leading our thoughts in communion. Uh, we appreciate you guys sharing your hearts 
Uh, we also want to thank the Beckton's for welcoming us. It's great to see your granddaughter. She's beautiful. And of course, thank you to the worship team who week in and week out continue to lead us in worship. We want to encourage you guys, as I'm sure you're already doing, to continue to pray for everyone that's being affected by the coronavirus and all the precautions that are being taken. You know, this week we learned of uh, someone else in the midpoint who tested positive for COVID-19. So uh, continue to pray for them, for the situation uh, that can be brought to a resolution quickly, that uh, God uh, will, will move in powerful ways and bring everyone through uh, safe and sound. We want to say a special thank you to all of our medical professionals out there who continue to put themselves out there, to put themselves at risk, to be able to serve and take care of everybody in the community, um, especially for all the essential workers that are still going out and uh, doing their jobs so that we can stay safe here. And so we thank you guys so much. We pray for your protection mm -hmm. and your health. Yeah. We have a few announcements as we continue our service this morning. Next Sunday on May 3rd, we're going to be having a new members Zoom call. And this new membership is actually going to extend back into 2019. So if you became a member of the Midpoint Ministry Center in, from 2019 all the way up to next Sunday, so that's anyone who was baptized, anyone who was restored to the fellowship, and anyone who moved into the Midpoint from outside of Chicago, we want to invite you into the Zoom call. We also want to invite uh, your discipling partner to come with you into the Zoom call. It's going to be from 7 to 8 p.m., next Sunday, May 3rd, and we'll get the link out for the Zoom call. But uh, our intention is to encourage you guys, uh, help you uh, grow in your faith, but also get a little bit more settled and, and oriented to, to life here in the Chicago Church of Christ in the Midpoint Ministry Center. So we look forward to seeing you and spending that time with you next Sunday. Uh, we have been so encouraged by all the things the Youth and Family Ministry has been doing to stay connected um, and engaged and just building faith in, in our youth during this time. So we would really love to encourage all the preteens, young teens, teens, and their parents to get connected to the leaders of those ministries so that your kids can stay connected, that their faith can keep growing and their relationships keep uh, getting stronger during this time. You know, it's been amazing to see how God continues to work in people's hearts, even amidst these crazy situations and circumstances. We've had two more baptisms this week in the Midpoint Ministry Center, and Christy's going to talk about the first one. Yes, it was so exciting. Last Sunday after our worship service, Tatiana Garcia, who is uh, in the Young Professionals Ministry, she was baptized into Christ, and uh, Tatiana is the daughter of... Um, Pablo Garcia, and we are just so, so excited for you. And then Friday night, the campus ministry had a baptism. Uh, Riley Whitting was baptized, uh, and so Riley, we're super happy for you. The Whittings are actually neighbors uh, to the Perkins, and um, so anyways, Riley, welcome to the Midpoint Ministry Center. Mm -hmm. I want to give you guys a heads up. You know, Last week after the sermon, we uh, sent out uh, some quiet times that we're in line with the sermon. We're doing that again this week. We're going to continue our series on faith. And so there'll be some quiet time sent out that go along with this week's message, which is actually going to be by Tanner Versage. I know we haven't seen them much lately. That's because he and Jess uh, had a baby, Emmett. I'm not going to say much about it because he'll talk about it in just a few moments here in the sermon. But anyways, um, be on the lookout for those quiet times. And then as always, for those of you who are uh, able um, we're, we're super grateful for your continued generosity and contribution that you give. You can always give online at chicagochurch.org slash giving. If you want to, you can mail in your, uh, your, your contribution to the church offices. Um, you can do this through a, sending in a check. We'll put up the uh, administrative office address on the screen right now. You can also get it from our church website, uh, but we're grateful uh, for your continued sacrifice in that area as well. Uh, we love you guys. We miss you guys. Mm -hmm. Hope you continue to have a great worship service. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you guys again. I mean, seeing whatever whatever this is, it's good to be here with you guys again. It's been a little bit of time for me. Uh, as many of you guys know, I took some leave because Jessica and I 
just had a baby boy. His name is Emmett. He is our second son. And I want to let you guys know he's doing really well. Mom's doing really well. Even our uh, two and a half year old son, Carter, is doing about as well as he can for a uh, brother that is not the only child anymore. So thank you guys for all of your prayers and that. We definitely felt it. Thanks for the meals and the encouraging messages. It was a weird time to have a baby and uh, this time of isolation, but we definitely felt very loved and connected to you guys despite all of that. And thanks for the prayers that are continuing to happen. We'll keep you posted on Emmett and his health and the things that are going on there. Uh, but we're just really grateful for you guys and the way that you guys have loved us and taken care of us during this time. And uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about faith. We're going to continue in this series that Clint initiated last week. Last week, Clint talked about having a seeking faith. And I felt so inspired after his his sermon about um, what it means to really seek God and to go after him again with, with a deeper and a renewed vigor and um, after seeking God today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a trusting faith. And I think that's a progression that makes a lot of sense. You know, first we, we seek God to figure out who he is. And then after we start to wrap our head around God a little bit or, or have some questions answered, then we're trying to figure out, okay, is this the God that I'm going to trust? Uh, is this the God that I'm going to give up some things and then follow? And so that's what I hope we're going to talk about today. I feel like this is really appropriate for the time that we're in today. And I also feel like it's appropriate because it probably suits pretty well where we are as a Midpoint Ministry Center. I think most of us have probably sought God for quite some time. We probably know him decently well, but there are things that come up in our lives that test us from time to time. Things that make us ask the question, am I really trusting God. And I would say off the bat that a faith that is tested is synonymous to a faith that is trusting. You can't really have trust until there's something that's tested. And I wanted to read a quote by uh, one of my favorite authors. His name is A.W. Tozer. And he says here, what we need very badly these days is a company of Christians who are prepared to trust God as completely now as they know they must do at the last day. It would be better to invite God now to remove any false trust, to disengage our hearts from all secret hiding places and bring us out into the open where we can discover for ourselves whether or not we actually trust him. That is a harsh cure for our troubles, but it is a sure one. Gentler cures may be too weak to do the work and time is running out on us. I think this quote is so incredibly important because while a seeking faith is important, it's not quite the sustenance we need to make it long term. We need to add to that first level of faith. We need we need an element that goes from do I seek God? Do I know if he exists? Do I believe he's good? But then something that's deeper and meaningful and causes us to then invest in that God that we began to meet. A faith that only seeks but never invest is like someone who intellectually believe that God exists and he holds eternity in his hands, but is never willing to follow that God. That's a limited faith. The seeking faith is incredibly important as we start our journey towards Christ, but it then has to be matured into something that's deeper and meaningful. Or, or to put it another way, the faith we talked about last week, the seeking faith, is like somebody who gets inspired to work out. They they go and they get the gym membership. They get the conviction to get healthy or, or learn or grow or get stronger. They might even go out and buy the clothes and the gear. They're excited to do it. That's that seeking faith. The trusting faith, what we're going to talk about today, is like that same person then going to the gym and sweating it out and using the equipment and getting stronger in the process of doing it, not just in the excitement up front, but in the daily process of applying it. I think working out is a pretty apt analogy for faith because I think faith is like a muscle. It's something that you use it or you lose it. It's something that gets stronger as we apply it. And it's also something where maybe you had a strong faith a while ago and you haven't touched it. But you might need it in a couple years from now, and it's not going to be as strong as it was if it just lies dormant until then. It's something that we need to continually engage 
in hopes that it gets stronger and stronger. I think what Tozer said in his quote is incredibly insightful for our climate. Sometimes we are unwilling to pursue trusting God because, you know, as it says, this is one of those harsher forms of doing it. It feels more like we're committing to something and we get scared of that commitment because sometimes that commitment hurts. Sometimes we've committed and we've, we've been let down before. There's a great Psalm in Psalm chapter 34, verse eight. If you want to turn over and read there, look on the screen, but it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Now, I know we've sung this song in the midpoint a couple times now, but this is one of my favorite passages to discuss when it comes to apologetics, because I think it takes something that can be at times so cerebral, so, you know, confusing. Does God exist or how am I going to find him or what are all the proofs? And it makes the proof really simple. It says, you taste it and see. Don't take my word for it. Just bite in and let me know if indeed he is a good God. Now, I will say it takes trust to have that level of faith. It takes trust to bite into something. You risk a stomach ache. You risk the food looking better than it actually is. But by biting into it, you will know for sure whether it is good. And that is this trusting faith that we're talking about. It's taking the cerebral. It's taking the, the magnificent things that just inspire us. And it's saying, okay, let's get down to the nuts and bolts. Are we willing to apply this faith to our life every single day? Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. We're going to read a story there, starting in verse 14. It says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into a fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus. Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit. He said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. I love this confession of the father right here, where he says, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. I mean, it's one of the most perplexing and paradoxical statements in the Bible. We read that and we're like, what? But we also read it and we're like, yes, exactly. That's what I feel. I think this statement says so much about us. It says so much about us as people following God that we're trusting God. We have a faith that wants to trust, but sometimes there are things that are there. There are things that, that test us, especially in a time like this. We trust God's goodness. We believe it, but then we get tested by it. And in those moments, there is something like this that can come out. You know, this pattern of, of trusting and tested faith is all throughout the book of Mark. And that's one of the reasons why I picked this version, the, the version of Mark uh, that Mark has of this story, because Mark uses this testing faith to really highlight something that Jesus is doing. So for instance, in Mark chapter two, 
And there's this man that's brought to Jesus, but he can't get there because of the crowd. And he's lowered on a mat. You know, the crowd's in the way. The roof is in the way. The logistics are difficult, but he's wanting to find access to Jesus. Maybe he needs the right people to do it, but he's wanting to get there. There's this in-between of he's not quite there, but he, he's not on the outside either. In Mark 4, there's this example where Jesus calms the storm. And, you know, there are storms in our life where we feel helpless too. There are things where we're like, okay, I, I do trust Jesus. I'm, I'm in the boat with Jesus, but it looks like he's hitting the snooze button right now. And maybe sometimes we even say things that we might regret later on. We might say like, Jesus, don't you, don't you care if we drown? We, we feel that. We know it's not true, but in the moment it feels so real. And that's that in-between faith. In Mark chapter 5, there's this demon-possessed man, and he's lived so long in the tombs and with so many challenges in his life that that's overtaken him. That's become his identity. He's He's been approached by so many people only to push them away, and I think Jesus comes in and he runs towards Jesus, but I'm wondering if, if he's afraid that Jesus might get pushed away. He's in between. He's close, but he's, he's not that close, and Jesus deals with that faith. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus is out walking on water. And, and while the, the account in Mark doesn't talk about Peter as much, we know the story. We know that Peter asked Jesus to come out on the water. And for a brief moment, he does. He takes a couple steps. He walks. He has this incredible faith. But then he looks around and he sees the wind and the waves and he begins to sink. His faith is, is trusting, but it's tested. It's in between. In Mark 8, there's this blind man at Bethsaida that Jesus comes to heal him. But like us, he kind of finds out that we need more than one encounter to be healed, to really know Jesus. Jesus heals him the first time and, and he says, he sees people and they, they look like trees. And, and there's this confusion that's going on there. And he's in between. He's not fully blind, but he doesn't have great sight yet either. In Mark chapter 10, there's another blind man um, named Bartimaeus, who's begging by the side of the road. And as Jesus is walking by, Bartimaeus calls out to him. And what's interesting is Bartimaeus is one of the only people in the gospel that gets the identity of Jesus correct. And he's the blind guy. And he understands who Jesus is. Yet he's got to overcome some things. He's got to overcome the people that are pushing him away, the people that are trying to shut him up. And for that moment, he thinks to himself, it is this enough? Did, I got it right. Is that good enough? Or, or am I going to follow this guy too? Am I going to shout even louder? Or am I going to be victim to those who are trying to shut me up right now? In Mark chapter 13, right before Jesus is about to go towards the cross, Jesus is telling his disciples many times over to watch out, to keep watch, and to pray. In the very next chapter, in Mark 14, the disciples fail to do those exact two things. They're in Gethsemane, and instead of watching out, and instead of praying, they fall asleep. And that's when the people come in and take Jesus away in that scene there. And I think, once again, that's another example of this in-between faith. They're close to Jesus. They're committed. But there are struggles. There are doubts. This is a real element of faith that we all face on a daily basis. It's a real element of faith that the Father faces here in Mark chapter 9. You know, the disciples' failure all throughout the Gospels is not highlighted to shame them. It's highlighted, I believe, to show that we can still come to Jesus the way that they came to Jesus. There were doubts there, yes. There were fears there, yes. And in every one of those times, Jesus solidified who he was, and helped people to follow him. If you recall back to the mid-90s, there was this show that was really popular on TV. It was called The X-Files. And in The X-Files, the main character, Fox Mulder, who's played by David Duchovny, is he's out to investigate whether some of these bizarre occurrences are extraterrestrial, or they're supernatural, or they're just conspiracy theories. Like, he's out trying to figure these things out. And there's a couple shots throughout the show where it pans into his office and above his desk, there's one of those motivational posters. And you've all seen them. They have people climbing and it says like reach or dream or inspire. And he's got this poster above his desk and it has a picture of a UFO. And on the poster, it says, I want to believe. 
And I think that's very similar to what the father here is saying. He's saying, I, I do, be- I want to believe, I, I do believe, but I have this unbelief still. I have this part of me that still needs your help, Jesus. I think we're all here too. And I think it's important that we admit that from time to time we are here. And we can we can be afraid of that. But what I want to encourage you with is this happens all throughout the Gospels. And I think it happens for the reason to push us back toward Jesus. So there's two quick things I want to end here with, two quick practicals that I think we can walk away with to help us have a stronger and more trusting faith. The first practical is simply to be self-aware. One of the things I love about the Father here is he knows exactly where his faith is at. He says, I do believe, but I have some unbelief that I need help with. He's aware of it. And that becomes this crucial starting point for him getting to the spot where his faith gets deeper and it grows and grows and grows. I think sometimes it's hard for me to admit that my faith isn't where I would like it to be. And there are all these insecurities about, well, I've been a disciple for a while, or what might people think about me? And I think those insecurities get in the way from us having a deeply trusting faith. Our ability to admit where we are is the first step to it growing and getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So I want to ask you, what fears or doubts creep into your life? Can you admit them? Can you open up with people that are in your life and say, from time to time, I wonder about this, or I doubt this, or I've been hurt by this feeling or fear in my life? What are some of those in-between places or battles that you face in your faith? Like so many of the stories we talked about, maybe it's the crowds of people that are in the way. Maybe it's these uncontrollable forces of nature that are surrounding us right now, and we we can't affect them if we wanted to. And all these things cause us to have doubt. It's important that we have a self-awareness and we admit that that doubt is there. Only then can we grow past it and get the help that we need from God. So the first thing is to be self-aware. The second thing, and this is really simple, is to actually give Jesus something that we trust. Like, hand it over. Let go. Um, Someone explained this analogy to me when I was younger, um, and it was the analogy of of someone describing themselves as a good driver. And maybe one of you might, might try and convince me why you're a good driver. I might try and convince someone else that you are a good driver. I could point towards your driving record could say you don't have tickets and your car's in in good condition, your insurance rates are really low. I've interviewed other people that have ridden in your car and they say that you're a good driver. I've seen you drive before pulling out of the parking lot at church and you looked like you were doing it in a safe and responsible way. Your tire pressure looks great. I could have all these reasons why I might think you're a good driver or tell someone else you're a good driver. And so I might say, I trust that you're a good driver. But that trust is not the same as me handing you the keys to my car with my two kids in the back seat and asking you to drive them home. That's a different level of trust because now I have something to lose. Now I have something that's deeply personal to me where if that trust is broken, I suffer from it. But that moment of trust is what actually helps me to believe in you even more. And I think the same thing happens with Jesus. We have to give him something to trust. We have to say, Jesus, I trust you have a great friendship or a great relationship for me and mind, but we can't say that and then continue to talk to people who aren't Christians and hope that that becomes a relationship that one day works out in our favor. That's not fully trusting God. That's trusting ourselves. Um, I think there's a great example of this in in 1 Peter 2. uh, Peter is talking about Jesus on the cross, and it says that while they were throwing all these insults at him, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. We all know that Jesus could have called down the angels. We all know that Jesus could have stopped the actions that were so unfair on the cross. But we also know that in that moment, Jesus gave up control to his father. He said, not my will, 
but your will be done. And once he said that, he didn't keep grasping for it. He let it go. That is a trusting faith. What can you give sacrificially that will stretch your faith? What can you give up to God? Maybe something you've been holding on or you've been holding on to a part of it here, hoping that you can still kind of tweak it to your favor. What is there that you're holding on to that you can really just give up and relinquish all control to? And let me be honest, this has got to be something where it feels like a loss when you give it up because those are the things that that prevent us from truly trusting God. It's easy to give God the, the things we don't care so much about. It's harder to give God the things that we deeply want to control. What are those things for you? I want to encourage us that if you feel in any way like maybe you are one of these in-between people, you're, you're someone who says, I have a faith, but it's not where I'd like it to be, or it's not what it once was, that is okay. Don't be discouraged by that. In fact, I would go on to say that the majority of the people that Jesus interact with in the Gospels have that level of faith, which to me shows that Jesus can absolutely work with all of us in that situation. When we're self-aware, when we know what our unbelief is, but when we're determined to have greater belief, I totally know that Jesus can help us with that. I know he can reach down to us and I know he can engage with us when we give those things up that hold us back from him. So let's be people this week that decide to give up those things that, that we're trusting, that we're holding on to. Let's put them into the hands of Jesus. Let's admit where those unbeliefs are, but let's run towards him even more. Amen. I hope you guys have a great day.